All right, here we go. By the way, is it DJ Envy or DJ Envy? <laughs> Any which way. DJ Envy seems to work. Okay, DJ Envy. We just did a feature on your car as well as the other cars that are here in your garage. Yep. But since you're here, I want to ask you a few questions. Sure. We haven't done a real interview in probably over a decade. Long time. At this point. So I figured we'll do a little bit of catch up. And the one thing I asked Charlemagne yes. when he came on my show last time was, who had the better Soldier Boy interview? Breakfast Club or Vlad TV? Last year, you had an interview with Soldier Boy. Yeah. Who do you think had the greater uh, Soldier Boy interview, me or you? Ooh. <laughs> it's a see, tough see, one. See, 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 they I, both has. I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why I, I would have to equal them, right? Because there's two moments in that interview that are forever memeable. The the, when, when, the over exaggeration. You know what I'm saying? Yo, me telling people how I survived 2020 and coronavirus, I see that now. And then, like, the way he said Drake, people use that inflection for, like, anything now. You know what I mean? Like, anytime they want to, like, Corona or or, or, it's another one they use now when uh, people imitate other people. Like, I just saw it when the the young lady who was pretending to be black, they was like, Rachel Dozal, when she finds out about this woman and this soldier boy, he stole my whole fucking flow. Oh, they put they put the coronavirus picture on Soldier Boy's head. No, it wasn't coronavirus. It was SARS. It was one of those diseases. And it was like Ebola when they find out about coronavirus. He stole my whole fucking flow. So it's just so many memeable moments that still apply to things that happen right now. So I don't, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know. I think it's pretty even. Like that's how I yeah. that's how I gauge things like that. Oh, Breakfast Club. Really? I think so. I mean, you know the Vlad TV interview, the pow, pow, that pow, 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 pow. pow. Yeah. Drake! You know, because that, you know, the Soldier Boy Challenge was launched from the Vlad TV interview. Everyone started doing professional actors and everyone else. Remember, it was a big deal. I mean, in you fact. You might have that one. You might have that one. I'm, I'm thinking about it now. The Drake was big. It was big. The sweatband. Yeah. Boy, that pow. That's classic. So yeah, I mean, that always comes up. Like you know, when when the Ukraine got invaded, they were like, you know, me telling my grandkids what what the <laughs> Ukraine war was pow, like. Pow, pow. Yeah, I, I give y'all that one. Y'all got that one. Y'all we got, got that, that one. I got that one. Uh, okay. Were you that expecting one. that to happen when you guys interviewed him? You know what? We don't expect anything when somebody comes for an interview because you never know. Hmm. The second time when Drip when uh, Soldier Boy came after that, yeah, he was calm. It was calm. So you just don't know what's going to pop somebody off, what's going to make somebody upset, how somebody's going to react. You just don't know, but you just go with it. Right. And I remember, I think, from that first Soldier Boy interview, uh, his Gucci headband, I think, got its own Instagram page. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that headband looked like it's been through a war. That was a big <laughs> moment. I don't even think they made that Gucci headband in years, but exactly. I'm I sure think... they made it after that. Was that like on his original album cover or something? Yes, like that? it was an old ass headband. Yes. <laughs> Crazy. Shout out to Soldier Boy, man. He's kind of going through some things right now mm-hmm. financially, but it seems like Soldier Boy always ends up on top. At the honest. end of the day, you know, me and him have had our back and forth over the years, but to me, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, he's an innovator in what he's done. Uh, the first rapper to go viral. Yep. Um, you know, a lot of people followed his footsteps. You know, at some point we may get him on Vlad TV again. Shout out to Soldier. But like him and love him. One thing about Soldier Boy, he has a catalog. He has records. So yeah. he'll always go on to a Soldier Boy beyond. Exactly. Now, the Birdman walkout. Yes. Were you surprised that happened? Not really. Why is that? Back then, there was certain protocol that artists would do when they walked in. And the protocol was when an artist would walk in, the first thing they would do was do a redrop for Revolt, because that's when we were on Revolt TV. Hey, what's up? This is Birdman. You're listening to Revolt. Tomorrow, I'll be on the show. He refused to do it. Refused? He didn't want to do it. Okay. So right then and there, we're like, something's up. Then usually an artist sits down before the interview and, you know, waits for us to finish the show. He didn't sit down. So we like, all right, something's up. And he was kind of just walking back and forth. So he's like, this is going to be something. And then he had a, like a large amount of people. So it wasn't like, you know, usually you come with your label rep and two people. I think Birdman was with like 12 people. Yeah. So we like, all right, this is going to be something. He's not happy. And as soon as he walked in, he started. And I, I, if you really listen to that interview, he started, he walks in, and the first thing I say is, start recording. Because I already hear it, and I see what it, if you If you really go back and listen, I go, start recording, start recording, because I already know what it is. So before he sits down, and he was like, all tree of y'all, y'all gonna put some respect on my name, and that's when he sat down, and that was the classic moment. All tree of y'all. All tree of y'all. All tree of y'all. All tree of y'all. <laughs> and he was just kind of just mad. 
like as soon as he started talking. He was very upset. What, what was he mad about exactly? Do you know? He felt like Charlemagne was playing with his name. And I think that's when Charlemagne was questioning the artist that was signed to him, if, if I can remember correctly. And he was very upset about that. And that was what he was upset about. And he wanted to confront Charlemagne. The crazy thing about Birdman is me and Birdman been cool since back in the days we, you know, we went on tour. I, I was on his first tour. It was Nelly, Birdman, Fabulous, and A. Marie. Like, so we've known huh. each other a long time. Who are you DJing for? Fab. For Fab. Okay, for Fab. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. And I mean, listen, you got to hand it to Birdman. I mean, you could say he's the greatest hip hop music executive of all time. He's one of them. I might not even say one of them. I might actually say him because if you look at his track record, I mean, he still has viable artists today. It depends how you break it down. If you put Nicki Minaj and Drake under that, yes, hands down, That's absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Hands down, absolutely. Because outside of that, you know, you could also say Suge Knight, Dr. Dre, Snoop. But what I'm saying Tupac. is. All those guys, their run ended at a certain point. I mean, Master P had a hell of a run, but the last time Master P had a viable artist was probably, what, 15 years ago or something like that? That's true. You know, Puffy, incredible run, but that run eventually started to, to fade out. Um, you know, Russell Simmons, once again, it's an incredible run. And you keep talking about these various people, but Birdman still has Blueface, uh, Jacquees, Mm -hmm. um, didn't he sign some other people recently? Not sure. And 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 really, if you count Nikki and Drake in that, then it sort of eclipses everyone already. That's true. You see what I'm saying? I, so, but I'm, I'm not sure if Nikki and Drake are still yeah. Young Money Cash Man. I'm not sure because I'm sure that they did enough albums where they're off. But if you keep it to that lineup, hands down, absolutely. No, nobody messes with, with, with Bird and Slim. All right. And the one thing that he mentioned to somebody, I forgot who it was, but he kind of pointed out that unlike the other music executives, mm -hmm. all he did was music. Yeah, he dibbled and dabbled here and there, but like he didn't go and start a clothing line that was all that serious sneakers. He didn't go and do headphones. He didn't do credit cards. He didn't do water. You know what I mean? Like all these other executives went and branched I think out. Bird and did, had looking for a little bit. I think he had a sneaker. He had for a little, little bit. Yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, it was he had slight. a well, with lugs. But it wasn't or, anything that made. Yeah, it was like a little side hustle, whatever. Correct. But I'm saying he never really all his effort went into the music. That's facts. Yeah. Because Diddy had, of course, Ciroc and of then course. De Leon and, yeah. and, and I Dr. Ciroc Dre had Beats by Dre. And, yeah. Yeah. A lot of these guys became billionaires, you know, Jay-Z, mm -hmm. like through their other ventures. Like the Tidal, other ventures started, the started yeah, to actually yeah, yeah. eclipse the music in a way. But with Birdman, really, it's just been all music. But then you could say that with Jay, too, because Jay had Rihanna. Yes. Jay has, I'm trying to think of some of the people, Kanye. Yeah. Jay has had. J. Cole. J. Cole. Yeah. You could put Jay up so there. You got to put Jay in that conversation, too. Jay is in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Great interview, by the way. Yeah. And I remember when he was like storming out, you were like, bye. <laughs> it seemed like you were kind of annoyed at the whole situation, too. Yeah, because I was really, I knew he was upset at Charlemagne, and, and I really wanted to have a conversation with Bird. And I think Birdman knew what, what, what it was. They called me later on, apologized to me. Oh, for, so they for apologized. That. To yeah, yeah. He apologized okay. to, to me. And I think he apologized to Ye, and he wanted to come back. Uh, we haven't had him back up there as of yet. I can't wait to get Birdman back up there. Okay, where did he say to you when he apologized? Uh, they called him just like my bad. You know, he was like, uh, you know, I felt Charlamagne was playing on my name, and I wanted to have that conversation. And I was like, all right, well, let's come back up and have the conversation. We just were never able to make that conversation happen. I mean, Birdman's all over the place. Me and him have been talking for the past, I think, six months about doing an interview, and it's like we just can't quite coordinate it. You know, I mean, he's always flying around. He's always, you know, he's working with NBA Youngboy now. He's yep. working with Lil Uzi Vert now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he always has hands in the music and in Absolutely. the hot shit. Mm -hmm. Like I said, people like Youngboy and Lil Uzi Vert, who's really the biggest, some of the biggest rappers, period, right now. And Burbank right there with him. Mm -hmm. You got to hand it to him. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, you were supposed to have an R. Kelly interview back in the day. Long time ago. <laughs> what happened with that? This was the mixtape day. So this was when I was maybe 1920. Mm. And this is when I was doing mixtapes and uh, they reached out to me and R. Kelly wanted to do an R&B mixtape. Uh, flew me out to Chicago. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. I remember it like flew me out like on a Friday. It sounds crazy that I say flew me out, but I was flown out. You got flew out. I got flown out <laughs> on a Friday. And uh, yeah, I get there, I get in a hotel, nice hotel, five star, everything first class. Friday, nothing. No, they didn't return my call. No studio. So I said, all right. Saturday. And it was supposed to be a weekend thing. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, wake up. No call. Now, mind you, I'm by myself. 
Nothing. Waiting, no call, no call. Saturday, so I got on a flight and flew myself back Saturday night. <laughs> I felt like I was an Instagram model that somebody flew out. They, they, <laughs> Change I, was too, mind. I was too ugly to holla at, but yeah, I was, it's just one of those funny stories. I think I was like 19 at the time. I mean, yeah, I interviewed R. Kelly uh, from jail, but all the conspiracy stuff he was talking about made me just not want to put it out. I mean, I mean, it's crazy how a documentary puts you in prison, which, I mean, not to say that he's innocent, because right. I don't think he is, but he was really living his best life up until surviving r kelly came out and then suddenly all the attention from that started to really just pile on and you know i mean what do you think of him being in prison right now i mean uh if he did what they say they did he deserves to be in prison i mean i i really you know the, the thing with when i comment on, on on things like that i like to know every side of the story before i make a comment and if it's what they said he did from the jury to the, what the judge said, yeah, he deserves to be in prison. He's, he's a pedophile. He took advantage of, of young girls. He took a, advantage of a situation. And, and if that's what he did, yeah. You know what I mean? I got four girls and I would hate for an older man to take advantage of my daughter because he's a celebrity or because he might not, he might know more than her. So if he did it and it's facts that he did it, he deserves to be there. I mean, being in the music industry, knowing what you know and how girls get down and stuff like that, I mean, do you have conversations with your daughters about that? And, you know, I mean, because yeah. I don't know whether they're going to go in the music industry, but with having a dad like you, there's a reasonable chance that they might, you know, kind of be involved. Yeah, I mean, you, you take it out take it out of R. Kelly, right? You just look at a young girl that's 16, 17 years old, 18 years old, very impressionable, right? They see their favorite artist on TV, their favorite artist singing, their favorite artist on the radio. They see him on concert. So now they get a chance to meet their favorite artist and they think they're in love. They think that that's what they want. Yeah. And a lot of artists can use that against them. Yeah. You know, they can use that to mind fuck a kid or mind fuck a teen. And some of these people are 35, 40. They've seen the world. They know what to say. They know what this young girl might want. Hey, I'm, I'm going to fly her to a destination where she's never been. Mm. I'm going to buy her a bag. I'm going to buy her a car. I'm going to do the little things that make her feel special. And especially if there's no dad in her life. Mm. Because if there's no dad in your life, you want that male figure. Yeah. And a lot of times people take advantage of these these kids and these teens and these young girls like that. And yeah, that's that's a fear of mine. But that's why I'm always in all my kids lives to make sure that that daddy's OK. That's what's up. Well, uh, Angela Yee, mm -hmm. she left the, the Breakfast Club recently. And I had Charlamagne on the show and he explained why, he, you know, he thought that she left straight from the horse's mouth. What was the reason that, sh you know, Angela left the Breakfast Club because I know Angela really well. I had done her show on lip service before she even, you know, joined the Breakfast Club and you guys became what you are. And, you know, I've been cool with both of y'all forever. So straight from you, what was the reason that she finally left? I think people wanted to be something salacious, you know, but it's, but it's not. Like, you know, she left Breakfast Club because she got the opportunity to do her own nationally syndicated show, you know, Way Up With Angela Yee is a nationally syndicated show. It comes on, you know, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. right after The Breakfast Club. And I mean, I think that's a, that would be hard for anybody to pass up. From your point of view, what do you think? I think she wanted her own. Yeah, that's pretty much what he said. I think that she, you know, she deserves it. And I think she wanted to give it a shot. You know, she had her own on Sirius uh, and she did well. And I think she wanted a situation when she wanted to blossom and, and do things that she wants to do with it. It's like anything else, when you're a team, you might not be able to get to do what you want to do at that particular time. But now she can do what she wants to do, talk about what she wants to talk about, have whatever guest she wants to do. And her show is doing great. So wish her the best of luck. I mean, after she left, she said a few things. Mm -hmm. She said she was the only female on staff. Mm -hmm. Charlamagne said that's not true. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That's not true. There was other females on staff. And if you ever go back to the comments and all that other stuff, there were other females on staff. And I think she cleared that up later on. But... You know, um, yeah, there were a million and one, I wouldn't say a million and one females, but just at the top of my head, there was Sasha, who was a producer. There was Taylor, who's a producer now. Uh, there were so many people, but I think she cleared that up and, you know, what she felt. I, I guess, I'm not sure what she meant by it, but even our boss, the person that actually, you know, the program director is a woman, Thea Mitchell, mm -hmm. that went to Hampton University, by the way. H you what up. But um, yeah, so there are women that work on the, behind the scenes in the Breakfast Club, absolutely. I mean, she talked about sometimes there was problems you know, on the show, as there are in any kind of mm -hmm. situation. Uh, you know, I've known Angela, I mean, forever. I used to go on a show on Sirius. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been on Breakfast Club a bunch of times. Um, I mean, do you felt like her being the one woman on there, that there were situations that may could have been handled differently and so forth? Or do you think that, you know, because she did make a few comments. There was a situation with Charlemagne when the two of them were talking, mm -hmm. remember? And then I remember on my show, he actually apologized 
to Angela for mm-hmm. some of the stuff that he said that he said could have been uh, phrased differently. You, you know what I'm talking about with that? Uh, you talking about with uh, Gucci Mane? Oh, okay, yeah, I guess that was it, mm-hmm. yeah. If me and Angela Yee weren't necessarily on the, the best of terms, I could see why she would feel like I'm, I'm not her friend. And you know, that's, that, that's, that's what I'm glad you asked me that question because nobody's ever asked me that, but it's like, I, I literally just apologized to Angela Yee for that. Like literally, I'm talking about like yesterday. If I'm doing this interview this today, I'm doing this today, this was literally like yesterday because we hadn't been in the studio since March. Um, because of the whole pandemic thing, man. And you know, I think one thing this pandemic made us all do, it just made us all like just sit down and, and, and reflect, you know? And for me, working with Envy and Angela for almost 10 years, I got genuine love for them. So what exactly was that about? Um, you know what? I don't know. See, I, I look at it like this. In every situation, it's a team. And if one of my team members don't want to do something, I'm going to ride with the team. That's just who I am. Whether it's Charlemagne, whether it's Angela Yee, a lot of times I'm put in the middle, but I'm loyal like that. So in that situation, I think it was a huge misunderstanding between the both of them. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's what usually happens when you don't get a chance to talk it out and talk things out. The sad thing about, I'm not going to say the sad thing, the dope thing about The Breakfast Club is we all started together. We all knew each other together. And I think when we all started growing, we all started growing separately and we didn't necessarily keep things cohesive. And I think if they would have had a conversation, I don't think it would have went as crazy as it was. And I think at that time, maybe the press jumped in between them. But I think I'm, I think that they apologized to each other or he apologized to her and, and they squashed it out. But I still think that what Angelie wanted is what she got. And that's her own show. And I think it's dope. I think she deserves it. I think Angelie is a, 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 a powerful person. She's a powerhouse in this industry. And I think the things that she does is dope. So if that's what she wanted, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for her. I mean, in terms of the, the current lineup, after she left, you guys started rotating different mm-hmm. guests. And Jess Hilarious seems like she's the one that's kind of sticking around more than others. Mm-hmm. Do you expect her to be part of the show in the future? Um, I love Jess Hilarious. I think she's dope. I think she's one, one of the ones that's stuck. Mm-hmm. And when I mean stuck, like fit right in, can crack a joke on myself or Charlemagne, are not as scared to do an interview. And there's a couple of others that really, really stuck. Now, just a matter of if if she wants to do it. I mean, because Jess is doing a lot of things. Jess is on tour every weekend. Jess is killing it out there. You see her on TV. But she is definitely one of the ones that I would love to have in that seat. Now, here we are with all the cars. Mm-hmm. And you and I were talking off camera, and you were telling me about some of the things that have gone wrong over the years involving cars. And the most serious one was a shooting incident. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Yeah, of course. What happened? Yeah, so I, I was DJing a club in Jersey. Uh, man, I was wearing all my jewelry and uh, I had security that usually comes out with me all the time. Uh, my security at the time was from Jersey. So they pretty much damn near drive me to the highway where I cross over the bridge because every night I would sleep at the radio station. I would leave the club at 4 a.m., have to be up at 6. It made no sense to go home. So I would sleep at the station. Security got me on the highway. Once I got on the highway, they kind of veered off and he went his way. Um, and we didn't know that there was a car following us. Car following us uh, pulled up behind us and put a police light on a siren, uh, and tried to pull me over. Uh, my father's a retired police officer, so I kind of know what police lights look like. And this was more of a blue light, which is usually firefighter, not police <laughs> officer. Okay. So when I seen it, I slowed down because I'm, I still wasn't 100% sure because you're going through your mind. Now, you, you're, you're black, you're driving, you're like, I don't want to make the wrong moves, but I'm looking, I'm like, I don't see that much red. So I started slowing down, and then the car ran into me, crashed into me. Wow. Trying to get me to pull over. When the car ran into me, I took off. Now, this time I'm driving a, a Rolls Royce Wraith and I take off, boom, they take off. Um, but I'm that kind of person, if somebody does something to me, I need to know who, why, what, and where. If not, I won't be able to sleep. If I pulled off on them and I, and I got out of Dodge, I would not be able to sleep because I'm like, is this a hit? Is this somebody looking for me? What is it? Uh, so for myself, I slowed down, I let them catch up to me and I went right through Easy Pass. If you don't know what Easy Pass is, it's, it's the device where you don't have to pay the toll, you put the little sticker in your car and you drive right through. But I pulled the Easy Pass down and the reason I pulled the Easy Pass down is when you go through it, it takes a picture of the car. They were so close on me, it took a picture of not only my car, their car. So when we got through the Easy Pass, they tried to cut me off. Now we're on a highway. I put the car in reverse and now I'm driving backwards. Okay. At that point, I realized that I didn't know, and my, some of y'all might not know out there either, that a car really only goes 35 miles per hour backwards. Right. So when you watch Fast and Furious, 
and the car is going backwards at 110 miles per hour. That's modified. That's, that's, that's all bullshit. Yeah, it's all bullshit. Okay. Only goes 35 miles an hour. So now I'm looking like Biggie in the, in the hypnotized video. <laughs> Back was trying to go in this car. So when I hit it in reverse, they jumped out the car. Now they're running towards the car. But I'm already in reverse going backwards. So they pull out and just start shooting at the car. Hit the car around four times. Uh, three were in the bumper and one hit the tire. Huh. Uh, shout to Rolls Royce because they make a sturdy car. The even though the bullet went in the tire, it got lodged in the tire. And I guess the whatever they have in that tire created a foam and kept the tire going so I could still drive and wouldn't be flat. Because if it would have been flat, I wouldn't be able to go and they would have caught up to the car. So I was able to, to drive out, spin the car around, go off the next thing. And there was a cop right there. And I got I pulled over right there and, and was able to uh, talk to the cop and make it home that next day. Okay, so you go to the cop. You tell him what happens. Your car got bullet holes in it. And then they start checking the easy pass. And they find the license plate of that car. Yeah. So what happened was uh, at first, I don't think the cops necessarily believed. Um, and all the cops came. And but, but there's bullet holes in the car. They did not. They still did not believe. Okay. Treated me like I, I was a, a, I feel like I was the, the suspect. Okay. Made a report and I went home. I didn't say nothing to anybody because a lot of times when things like that happen, all you have to do is be quiet. Somebody's going to talk. Um, and I guess one of the cops in the actual precinct knew who I was. It was like, that's DJ Envy's car. And after that, when I got off the radio the next day, there must have been 20 police cars at my house. Uh, and, you know, they did, you know, they, they took the car. They did ballistics. They even did uh, look for gunpowder because they thought maybe I was shooting back at him at the time. So they mm -hmm. checked all that. Um, and like you said, Easy Pass. So I told them what happened to Easy Pass. They checked the Easy Pass records. They found the guy. They found the car. And the guy was arrested. I think he did a couple of years. I think he did like six, seven years. So he kept his real license plate on his car while he was attempting to basically rob you. Correct. So they didn't want the car. They wanted the jewelry. Wanted the jewelry. Okay. So the guy gets arrested. Did you have to go to court and everything? No. Mm -mm. They pleaded out. Oh, they, you, they was, their face was on candy camera. Was it one guy or multiple guys? It was, uh, I think it was two, three people in the car. Two or three people. That is so not worth it, man. Seven years for nothing. Correct. Got nothing out of the situation. Nothing at all. Was that the first time? Because I remember our first interview, we talked about how Nas pulled a gun on you. <laughs> you know, when you try to hand him a mixtape. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been shot? So you, you've had guns pulled on you before. Have you ever been shot at before? Yes. Really? Another situation. Uh, well, first of all, I just say thank God for New Jersey and New York and everybody legalizing firearms. So now I'm allowed to carry, and I'm, I'm thinking like 40-something states. So different, different, different day, different era. Uh, this is when I was probably about 22, 23, uh, walking out the club. Uh, and this is before, <laughs> this is before social media. So I'm walking out the club. It's about 3.30 in the morning. I see two guys coming across the street, dressed up, dressed up in all white, clean. And I see them looking at me and they start crossing the street. It's going to sound stupid. But back then I thought they wanted an autograph, <laughs> right? Because there was no social media back then. So nobody yeah. was just taking pictures or nothing like that. Um, so they come around and, uh, I'm on the left side of my car. It's a Range Rover at the time. I'm on the left side. And my two boys is on the right side. So they come on this side. So my boys don't even see them. So they're like, yo, give me your chain. So me, I sound stupid. I'm like, huh? What? Give me your chain. So I'm, I'm trying to talk loud so my peoples can hear them. I'm like, huh? What? So now my peoples went around and was like, what's up? So now the dude steps back with a gun. I take my chain off. Now, it's a little building. It's the city. I try to throw the chain on the building. Why? I don't know. It's Wait, you threw it up in the air I onto to, the building? I try to throw it on the building. <laughs> okay. I don't know why. So the other dude hits my arm. The chain falls under the car. So now he has the gun out. He's like, yo, give me your chain. Give me your chain. One, one of my friends run. The, my man stays. And I'm like, I don't know where the chain is. So he goes right there. There it goes. So he goes and picks up the chain. They run down the block and fires one shot. Pow. I sound like Soldier Boy now. Pow, pow. So they fire one shot, pow. They hop in a, a, a BMW and take off. Okay. What do I do? I hop in my range and chase them. You chase them? I chase them. Okay. So now we're going through Manhattan. High speed chase. I'm chasing them. We're switching lanes, crossing over. We're going this, that, and the other, yada, yada, yada. We go all the way around to the, to the Brooklyn Bridge. And right when we go to the Brooklyn Bridge, I guess they were going to do like a some type of thing where they jump off and, and, and maybe go fake left and go right. They fake left, couldn't go right, crashed. Mm. So now they hop out the car. So now they're running towards me. Now I just told you they had a gun. Yeah. I didn't. 
So now I'm backing again down the street because I'm <laughs> thinking they're coming at me, shoot me. Then I realize that they don't. And now they, they get down the street. Now they're running down the street. One runs right, one runs left. So I start chasing the run, the guy that runs left, the driver. So we chase them and then we jet, he's running. And now we're on him. I jump out the car, didn't put the car in park. So now the car hits like <laughs> 10 park cars. Bang, 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 bang. But I'm trying to catch this guy. We catch him. Okay. Me and my friend catch him. Now my friend is in the car, so I jumped out. He can't jump out because it's hitting park cars. He jumps out and it's a construction site. And we uh, detain him, <laughs> legal terms. We detain, detain him. him until the police come. Okay. Uh, we detain him. Uh, I guess with the process of us detaining him, he's in a coma. In a coma? Coma, yes. Okay. He's in a coma. Uh, he was in a coma for a couple of days. Uh, now, this was the time when I, when I was doing a lot of parties in New York City, and this was the quote-unquote streets. So when the cops came, it was like, you have to press charges. I was like, I'm not pressing charges. The main reason was because I'm like, I'm a DJ in New York City. You know where I'm at every night. Mm -hmm. If I press charges, it might be, and I don't know where it came from, this, that, and the other. And the second charges is, oh, you don't snitch. You don't snitch. Stupid mm -hmm. shit ever. Yeah. But I'm, mind you, I'm young. I'm like 22, 23 at the time, or whatever I was. I was, I was pretty young. So the, the kid wakes up out the coma. Uh, and I remember this like it was yesterday. I'm at Hot 97 at the time working, Miss Jones in the morning. And they say, uh, Envy, police are downstairs for you. So I'm like, well, what are they downstairs for? He was like, I don't know. They, wanted, they said they want to talk to you about a robbery. So I go out the back door and I dip. Oh, so you don't meet with the police? No. Okay. Dip. I called the district attorney. District attorney was like, well, you know, we need you to come down here. I'm like, why? They was like, well, this gentleman just woke up out of a coma and said you robbed him for his Rolex. Oh, okay. Wow. And because you didn't do a statement, we only have his statement. Huh. So I said, all right, we go down there. So me and my pops go down there. And, he, and so now and your dad is a police officer at the time? He's retired. At the retired time. at the time. Okay. So my pops, me and my pops go down there. And they're like, yeah, so we need you to, they was like, well, if you don't press charges on this kid, you know, he, he's saying that you robbed him. And beat him. And beat him. Right. Even though we held him down and detained him to the police camp. So um, I'm like, nah, we're not doing that. So I'm, I'm telling my dad, like, nah, I don't want to do that. Then the police goes, and this is where I say, if anybody who does anything in Manhattan, you're a damn fool. They go, you sure you don't want to do it? And I'm like, nah. They were like, have you seen the video? <laughs> I'm like, video? He presses play and it's every scene from me driving, chasing him to the car crashing, to us catching him, to us detaining him and everything. And it was like, so I'm going to ask you again. Are you going to press charges on the guy that robbed you? I was like, yeah, what door is it? What door do I have to go in? <laughs> yeah, but, you know. So well, that's but, but they didn't have footage of them trying to rob you initially? No, they didn't have that footage. Oh, they only had footage from the start. everything from the start, after from the that. Start. Exactly. Oh, so you're kind of screwed in, yeah, in a way so, over that. Yeah. So that, that was the uh, last the last bit. And then uh, from then, I always had security. And Okay, yeah. well, let me ask you a question. So you then decided to press charges. Mm -hmm. And does your man also, like, press charges as well since he was there? No, so what wound up happening, and this is all alleged because I don't remember this part of it, but the funny thing about it is, one, the kid was driving his mom's car. <laughs> Two, they said he had just won the lotto the week before. Won like 80000 in the lotto. In real life, he won the lotto. And he's robbing people right afterwards? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, and what happened to him ultimately? Uh, he, got to, he had to serve a couple of years. Okay. He actually got out early. He actually got out early. I guess there was a, something with a, a, a missed child or something like that. He actually got out early. But, um, but what about all the cars that you hit? Do you have to pay for all the cars that you damaged? The, you know, the good thing about that, and see, these are things you learn. Uh, insurance only pays for a certain amount. Right. Thank God the cars that I hit were like Toyotas and Nissans. So it wasn't that much of an expensive. But you had to pay for all those cars. The to insurance, my insurance had to Your pay insurance for all those cars. Yeah. I was dropped after that. <laughs> I was definitely dropped after. I think it was Liberty Mutual. They dropped me right after that. <laughs> that was it. Okay, final question. You've done hundreds of interviews yep. over the years, maybe even thousands. Is there a single interview you feel is your favorite interview of all time? Hmm. My favorite interview. There was so many of them. You know, and I really like the interviews of two people. I like the interviews when it's a fresh artist when they haven't had training yet, and they're very, very open. And I like an interview of, uh, 
I would say like a vintage artist, like an artist that's been through everything and doesn't care anymore about press and just has a conversation. I always love my Fat Joe interviews because Fat Joe is a storyteller. Yeah. He's going to tell a story. He's going to he's going to paint a picture like no other. Uh, I do like interviews like when Jay came up because you don't get that too much. Yeah. Um, when we got a chance to talk to like Jennifer Lopez and even even when um, Farrakhan came up there. The, the crazy thing about the Farrakhan interview is growing up, you know, you hear about Farrakhan and you don't like what he says, right? Because of what the people tell you. So I remember when Farrakhan came, I didn't want to do the interview. I wasn't going to do the interview. I actually wasn't going to go in that day. And I remember my wife pulled me to the side and was like, why don't you see for yourself? Like, I get it. Why don't you see for yourself? And we were able to have a great conversation with him. And I thought that conversation was, was really good. So I thought the Farrakhan interview was a great conversation. I also thought, I'm trying to think of another conversation that was really surprising to me, that just really, really opened my mind. Uh, even Barack Obama. I was going to mention that one. That was a big deal. I think Barack Obama was a, was a big one because he's the president. Yeah. Who gets to talk to the president? So I thought that was was pretty good. And even when we got a chance to speak to Hillary Clinton, mm. and the reason I thought Hillary was dope, not necessarily because of Hillary, because we had Stevie Wonder sing our happy birthday. Mm. And that was the first time we got a chance to meet Stevie Wonder. I thought that was dope. I think the first time, I think the time we spoke to Prince was dope. You spoke to Prince? Oh, I didn't even know that. Okay. It wasn't an interview. What happened is it was like six o'clock in the morning with Breakfast Club. And uh, nobody was in the building. And somebody was like, Prince is here. Huh. He was like, yeah, all right, whatever. And um, we, put, we put the Breakfast Club on autoplay. And we went out to the hall. And there's Prince walking with these two women. And we're sitting there like, oh, that's Prince. Oh, so, you know, I say, I think Angela goes, a Prince, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And I say, like, I'm a huge fan. And Charlemagne is, is pretty much stuttering. <laughs> and um, this is the first time I, Charlemagne didn't even know what to say. He was like, uh, Prince was like, hello. And instead of saying hello, he was like, uh, I'm Seven Day Adventist too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Prince, Prince looks at him and was like, okay, maybe we should have that conversation. And I think we tried to get a picture. And he says, no, not right now. Mm. And he starts walking off. And then Charlemagne takes a picture of Prince. Right. And we, the, the prince, the pictures of him walking away. And Charlemagne takes the picture. We run back inside. We're like, look at the picture, look at the picture. We look at the picture and we look at like, oh, that was really Prince. And then the prince just, the picture just evaporates from his phone. Wait, what? <laughs> you tell me the prince has magical powers. Swear to God. To erase pictures off other people's phones. Swear to God. Where's my phone? I'm a, where's my phone? Let me, all right. We can't get Charlemagne yeah, to can't get Charlemagne on phone. But Charlemagne took that picture and it was gone. And we talk about it all the time because we was like, this is the one time in, in history that we have a conversation with Prince and we, and we have no documentation. There was no proof. But we were all there. Me, Angeli, and Charlemagne were there. But it wasn't an actual interview. You guys just... Nah, we just got a just chance talk to him talk to him for I a thought, second. Okay. I think that was the coolest thing. I'm like, who gets a chance to talk to Prince? Even if it's for a minute. Yeah, I've never talked to Prince. Nah. I thought that was dope. So those, those are probably my, one, my favorites. Yeah. That's what it is. DJ and me, man. I appreciate you uh, letting us into your garage here. Oh, thank you. And, uh, you know, showing this incredible collection. Uh, I learned so much about cars. You know, I thought I knew about cars until I came here. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know shit about cars. But let me ask you a question before you go. Yeah. What was your favorite interview? My favorite interview. Done? There's two. Mm -hmm. There's the Keefe D interview. Mm -hmm. Because I feel that essentially solved the Tupac murder. Okay. Tupac, who is arguably the greatest rapper of all time. There's been so many conspiracy theories about how he got killed. It was the government. I mean, his own dad recently said it was the government that killed him. Suge Knight had him killed. Yep, yep, yep. You know, all this kind of stuff. To actually sit with someone who was in the car when the shooting happened and give a play-by-play -play of everything that happened leading up to it during the actual incident and then afterwards, I think had never been done before. And I felt that historically that was a very important interview. Absolutely. My other one is a uh, fat more van from Millie Vanilli mm -hmm. because for those that don't know, Millie Vanilli was the first and only artist to ever have their Grammys taken away from them yeah. because they were lip syncing their songs. And to actually, you know, that was just such a huge deal. In fact, it changed the laws yeah. to the point where you actually have to say who the vocalists are on albums and everything else like that. So to break down that whole situation of what led up to them almost being forced to lip sync music from a producer that was doing that with other artists as well to, you know, the aftermath of the embarrassment, having to give back their Grammys and his partner ended up dying from a drug overdose. Yep. 
possibly suicide, depending on who you talk to. I just feel that historically that was such an important interview that that, you know, I would say that's my second most important interview. Those two. Wow. Yeah. What's the what's the guy from Millie Vanilli doing now? He's living out in Europe. I mean, he does like commercials. He does music on the side. He still looks good, you know, long dreads and, and so forth. Um, yeah, man, very cool guy. And it's a story that's been told here and there, but right. never first person. Totality, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, you could do documentaries, and usually in a documentary, there's like 30 people talking. It's different when you have one person telling their own life story. Um, in third place, I would say Smokey Robinson. Mm. Because uh, that's probably the most accomplished artist that I ever sat down yeah, with and, and interviewed. Like, I mean, this guy's like the blueprint of soul music. Absolutely. You know, Motown to, you know, everything else that he's done. I think he yeah. has like 10 Grammys or, you know. What, what, does he have 10 Grammys? That's some ridiculous amount. Maybe he has one Grammy. I don't know. But the accolades and that the music has, yeah. and the timelessness aspect, the timeless aspect of his music was just mind blowing. And the guy's like, you know, I think 80 something years old. Mm -hmm. And to really see the history of music being told firsthand, I thought was was amazing. Yeah, and I think Patty LaBelle, I think going to Patty's house mm. and Patty cooking for us, I thought was amazing. That's dope. I think, you know, people have interviewed Patty, but the fact that we actually went to her house and she cooked yeah. us breakfast was different. Yep. It was different. That's what it is. DJ Envy. You, you. Until next time. Yes, sir. Peace.